Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, what's at stake for Arizona if Obamacare is repealed but not replaced? Also tonight, the Cactus League season is getting underway soon, and we take you to a Scottsdale museum that focuses on Western art and culture. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. There was an education rally at the state capitol today. A group of parents and teachers delivered hundreds of postcards to Senate President Steve Yarborough and House Speaker J.D. Mesnard asking for a public hearing on the state budget and education funding. We've been cutting funding for schools since the recession, a uh, billion and a half dollars taken from our public school students that's uh, increased class size and made us uh, get rid of art and band in too many of our schools. We want to replenish that funding, bring it into our public schools, and give students the opportunity to, uh, to be successful. So many of us feel as if our voices haven't been heard uh, because quite often it, we seem to be the last that the legislature asks, particularly when it comes to the education budget. And that's why we're asking them today to hold a public hearing on the budget prior to the budget bills being introduced so that they know how those people most affected feel about it. Many at the rally emphasized that public input is critical for a more transparent appropriations process. And secretaries of state from around the country gathered in Washington for their annual meeting. One of the things discussed was the claim by President Trump that millions of people voted illegally in the 2016 presidential election. Arizona Secretary of State Michelle Reagan was at the meeting and addressed the issue of voter fraud in Arizona. It's not as widespread um, because of the systems that we have in place. So in Arizona, we obviously have voter ID at the polls. We have a citizenship check upon registration of voters. These are things that some states have, some states don't. But the fact that we have them in Arizona makes our system more free from fraud. Reagan previously claimed that she could say, quote, with confidence that there was no widespread voter fraud in Arizona. Republicans and President Trump have promised to repeal the Affordable Care Act, but without a proper replacement, billions of dollars in economic output and tens of thousands of jobs could be lost in Arizona alone. Joining us now is State Representative Heather Carter, chair of the Arizona House Health Committee. Also with us is President and CEO of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Glenn Hammer, and Greg Vigdor, President and CEO of the Arizona Hospital and Healthcare Association. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. We Good appreciate it. Great to be here. Thank you. Repealing the Affordable Care Act without a replacement, full repeal, no replacement. Your thoughts, impact on Arizona. Well, one thing when we're looking at health care in Arizona specifically, we need to understand that the health care sector is truly a major economic engine to the state of Arizona. And that means not only providing high quality health care to the citizens of Arizona, but also some of our largest job providers. For example, Banner Health is the largest private employer in the state of Arizona. Honor Health, largest employer in Scottsdale. And in our rural community, they provide many jobs that keep our communities alive. So when we're talking about uh, what the next steps are uh, for health care in the United States, we need to make sure that we're looking at what is the impact to our state of Arizona. Impact, Glenn, if, again, the Affordable Care Act is repealed but not replaced. Here's the good news, Ted. It's very clear to me that these are going to move together. You, you can't repeal it without a good replacement. And there's going to be a lot of repair work. As Representative Carter uh, mentioned, the economic impact is enormous. I mean, we're talking with, when we're talking about our hospitals, 190,000 jobs, $30 billion worth of economic impact. From our conversations with our federal delegation, particularly our two United States senators, it's very clear that any sort of re repeal of the Obamacare, which, which I do expect will happen, is going to happen in tandem with a thoughtful uh, replacement. If there's a thoughtful replacement to the Affordable Care Act, will that mean that these jobs will no longer be in jeopardy, that the folks who have coverage now will still find a way to be covered? Well, the details matter in this debate, so it really remains to be seen what gets on the table and what moves forward. But there's ways to address these things. Just as we were able to work with the Obama administration and the Congress then, we're willing to work with the other side now as they try to make this law work. When you say you're willing to work with them, what do you tell them? We tell them that our primary concern is really taking care of patients and that promoting the health of our communities. 
Uh, that's really the cornerstone of our work, but there are consequences, including the economic consequences to Arizona in particular, if we do it wrong. And then we just have to be thoughtful, really look at the analysis, look at what's going to be the real impact, and build from there. And, and uh, we want to get back to the economic impact in a second here, but as far as human beings are concerned, moving from spreadsheets to human beings, how many will be affected, and what do they do? Where do they go? Again, we're saying if there's not a, a, a proper replacement for Obamacare. So it, it, the apple cart's going to be upset a little bit, isn't it? Well, the good news is that our governor has expressed um, the concern to make sure that the rug is not pulled out from underneath any citizens in Arizona. And we have worked together across all of our elected officials in Arizona to make sure that we are sharing our concerns with our delegates back in Washington, D.C. And what we really want to make sure that they understand is that in terms of the impact to the system, any impact on some of our, our top providers of health care in Arizona actually will impact the patient. And so we are just trying to make sure we have an open dialogue moving forward so that when they are making these critical decisions back in D.C., they have all of the information that they need. Rural hospitals, I mean, community hospitals, the big concern here as to what's next. What do you tell them? Well, for a lot of, well, what we tell them is that, first of all, we understand how important it is to get this right. Uh, during every summer, I take a road show and I go all over, go all over the state. And what I heard from a lot of the rural hospitals is that the Medicaid restoration was absolutely vital in terms of them continuing to operate. The good news is that when you take a look at uh, what Governor Ducey has done, and he put together a very thoughtful letter to the uh, U.S. House Majority Leader, you know, where he said that Congress must ensure that their replacement plan does not increase hospital uncompensated care. We'd say amen. Let's also remember, though, there are huge problems with Obamacare, you know, the most obvious being the exchanges. The Obamacare exchanges have been an unmitigated disaster. That's something that it would be hard for me to imagine a proposal that didn't improve that situation. Would it be hard for you to imagine a proposal that didn't improve that situation? Because a lot of folks are insured now that weren't insured prior to Obamacare. That's right. There's over 500,000 Arizonans who now have coverage as a result of the act. There's other ways you can provide coverage, and I think we're going to find them. I agree with Glenn that we're, our, at least our delegation is rallying to the cause of not just repealing, but finding a replacement. Medicare reimbursements, where does that stand now, and how big a deal is that as far as a replacement? So here's the deal with Medicare, and it goes back to passage of the act, which was uh, Congress and President Obama needed money to pay for the Medicaid expansions and for the subsidies to buy into the individual insurance market. A big chunk of what they found in terms of revenue was actually Medicare cuts to hospitals, over $155 billion nationally. And now as we consider the question of a possible repeal, if it doesn't include some coverage for those people, that was the, the exchange for hospitals, um, then we have to go back and revisit those cuts or there's no way that our hospitals will be able to make this world work. From a third, for, go ahead, please. Well, and I think it's also time that we start adding a third word to our conversation about the Affordable Care Act. You hear people talk about repeal and replace, but we really need to look at restoring some of the funding cuts and then talking about that repeal and replace, because that's going to be a game changer for our health care systems in Arizona. Example of funding cuts that according Medicare repayments and reimbursements. Medicare being one uh, primary concern in terms of if those cuts remain in place and any repeal and replace uh, policy decision doesn't include include addressing those issues, then we are concerned. Also, care that uh, is provided to the indigent and the disproportionate share that hospitals receive, that's also another source of funding cuts. If, if Again, if the Affordable Care Act was meant to address those not insured, uh, not working through an employer, getting insurance through an employer, uh, young people, uh, those with uh, chronic illnesses and, and pre-existing conditions, can those, is it just going to be Obamacare by another name? How do you, how do no. you change this? Well. There is a lot of work that, that needs to be done so that when it is changed, it, it actually functions. But again, when you take a look at the Obamacare exchanges, I'm not talking uh, Medicaid, I'm talking about the Obamacare exchanges, we went from a situation in this state where we had a lot of different providers to now in most of Arizona, we're down to one provider with very dramatic cost increases for a lot of Arizona families in terms of their premiums. That to me is the most obvious, blindingly obvious place to start in terms of 
uh, repairing and, and creating a replacement system that does more to uh, not just get the markets right, but, but to really uh, uh, protect and help people, more consumer choice, it, things like that. Is a health, I mean, I've heard people say that if there is not a proper replacement, that a health care recession could be possible. Is that possible? I don't believe it's going to happen. I mean, you, you have right now, you know, one of the criticisms of Obamacare, the way it was passed, it was jammed through. There was zero Republican support. It was an abomination of a process. I believe while it is painful for some of the Republicans who have been saying for a number of years we're going to repeal Obamacare, I, I want to give them credit for, for moving forward in a methodical way, reaching out to hospitals, reaching out to chambers, making sure that whatever they're doing is going to result in a better system. They should be commended for that. Would block grants make better sense? Would, uh, would per capita funding make better sense? Those are just labels. The real question is the funding beneath it and the policy change. If there's a way to make our program more efficient, great. But um, a lot of those terms are really about whether we're going to cut the level of funding that we're going to get. Um, so that's really the important issue for us. One of the other things to note is that we've actually been doing a lot of this work in Arizona through our access program. It's actually recognized as one of the leaders among Medicaid programs across the nation. We've been doing these things through what are called waivers. So whether that's really going to advance care in Arizona, I think, is doubtful. I think we want to continue on the path we're on and explore those policies further. And that point's really important. We should not be penalized because we've been the most efficient. I mean, I think we have, in Tom Bedlack, the best Medicaid director in, in the country. There are other states like New York that have arguably been gaming the system for a long time. So we've got to be very careful that in any sort of replacement, Arizona's not penalized for doing the right thing. You agree with that? Absolutely. Arizona is the gold standard in Medicaid systems, and we've done it in partnership with the private sector. And so when you're looking at a replacement for the Affordable Care Act, a one-size model does not fit all. And specifically, what works in California and what works in New York would not work in Arizona. However, the converse may be true. I think other states can learn a great deal from what we've done in Arizona to really provide the most cost-effective and efficient system in the country. Can what we've done in Arizona survive something that is not the Affordable Care Act? I, I believe it can, and I believe it will really be part of a process of all of the elected officials from the state to the federal government working together and figuring out what those components are. Sure. We're, we're going to get a better product. I mentioned the health care exchanges. There's also other areas where there's bipartisan support. For example, like eliminating the Cadillac tax, uh, the medical device tax, the health insurance tax. There's bipartisan support within Arizona. So this, this, this may not be as fast as people thought, but I do believe at the end of the day we'll come out with a better product that will be good for the state of Arizona and as important to our uh, citizens. Real quickly, better product, especially a better product uh, considering what we were experiencing before Obamacare. We will find the way. The American health care system, the Arizona health care system is amazingly resilient. I think the real question is how do we make sure there's not consequences that affect patients. If we put them in the center, we'll get where we need to be. All right. Good discussion. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. And we'll be back in a moment with a look at spring training baseball and the upcoming Cactus League season. Hi, I'm Paula Kirker, president of PBS, and I'd like to personally thank you if you've made a contribution to Arizona PBS. You know, when you fund your favorite shows on this station, you're ensuring great television continues to be available for yourself, your family, and everyone in your community. One of the easiest ways to do that is by making a monthly contribution on an ongoing basis, what we call sustaining membership. When you call, tell us how much you'd like to donate each month. Our current sustainers tell us that 10, 15, or $20 a month is best for them, but you decide what works for you. After you've made that call, we will deduct that amount each month from your credit card or your bank account, and we will continue until you tell us otherwise. Your membership will always remain current, and renewal notices will become a thing of the past. Best of all, your ongoing support means that the best television on television will continue to come your way every single day of the year. So please, consider a sustaining contribution today. Thank you for your support of this PBS station. And the roar of the crowd, that's what you'll soon be hearing at Valley Cactus League stadiums as 15 Major League Baseball teams begin spring training play. Here now is Jeff Meyer, the president of the Arizona Cactus League Association. Good to have you here. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining us. Good to see you get 15 teams, 10 facilities. What is the state of the Cactus League? Well, we're gearing up for another year with the Cubs winning, of course, the World Series. That's a great way to start off the season. 
and we're going to be hosting the World Baseball Classic again this year. Yeah, that's three that, years. Yeah, but, but as far as the Cactus League in general, healthy, healthier, not quite as healthy. Where, where are we standing? I'd say we're very healthy. We've, we're coming off two years in a row now. We've been right at the million nine uh, attendance mark for the last two seasons, and we're excited if the as long as the weather cooperates with us that we have a chance to to break that record. How about the teams? Is everyone happy? Is you hearing any threats to leave? Anything like that? Uh, no, nothing at all from that perspective. So, you know, we're, we have 15 teams, like you said, in, in this market, and Florida has 15 as well. And I think Major League Baseball likes it that way, yeah, having was, split up. I was going to say, is uh, any Grapefruit League teams kind of looking longingly in this direction? No, a lot of them just, just recently renewed their contracts. So we, there's no really buddy in the mix in that respect that's uh, looking at moving. How about ballparks? The local teams here, everyone pretty much happy with their ballparks? There's been some moving around and shuffling here. What, how's that stand? Well, there have been a couple new ballparks have been added the last few years, of course, with Sloan Park, with the Cubs, which has been drawing quite a you know, good attendance records from that perspective, and then Salt River Fields was just a newer facility as well. Uh, as far as the ballpark that you think will probably need attention the soonest, which is the one out there that looks like it's, it's due for gussing up? Well, Surprise is, is actually talking, just having discussions currently with the, uh, is a new contract with, with the teams potentially here, so that's probably upcoming. So watch out for that one then. Yep. Financial impact of the Cactus League, uh, d d where is that impact felt? What kind of money are we talking about here? Uh, annually, we're looking at $456 million a year. We, you know, we had a study done in 2015, and we've used that number. We'll be conducting that study again next season. Regional nature to all this, or is it pretty much uh, locally? Well, uh, half of our, half the attendees are from out of state on an annual basis, so it's nice from that perspective to have the travelers coming in. But uh, um, we just feel fortunate that we have other things within the state of Arizona to offer in addition to the spring training. Is there is there a is there a typical Cactus League fan? I mean, if you could just put one together, what would he or she look like? Uh, baseball enthusiast uh, enjoys the weather, um, family family time going to the ballpark. From certain part of the country more likely than others? Well, the Midwest, uh, you know, a lot of followers, of course, and I think the excitement with the Cubs, we'll be seeing a lot more people from that part of the, part is, of the states coming. And as far as the difference between local fans and out-of-towners, is there a percentage difference? I mean, what, what are you seeing out there? Well, it's about 50-50 split is what it is from perspective. Really? Of, yeah. Uh, half, half of the attendees will be from out-of-town. And is, if there's a part of the country that you're looking to maybe have a little better representation? Where, where, where could the marketing be a little stronger, do you think? Well, um, uh, California, which obviously is a tourist state as well, to get more people over from the state of California. Uh, the Giants, I don't travel very well. I'm associated with an organization that hosts the Giants. And, and uh, But uh, overall, uh, we're just excited that Starting to play ball here on Friday. Yeah. Uh, history of the Cactus League. I've been doing this long enough to remember when there was a lot of concern regarding the Cactus League. Uh, give us a little bit of a background there, where the Cactus League has been uh, compared to where it is now. Well, I, I, I have to benefit from that perspective. Uh, former Governor Rose Mofford, I think, played, was very instrumental in a forming a commission back in the early 90s, mid 90s. And uh, that was the time when we potentially were going to lose some teams to Florida. And a lot of people stood up and embraced the situation and uh, came up with some additional funding sources for uh, new stadiums to be built. Yeah, and uh, obviously, as you mentioned, the, uh, the Cubs winning the World Series. The Cubs have always been a big draw here, uh, regardless of the stadium. Um, but winning the World Series, I mean, what are you expecting? I mean, it's going to be a madhouse. Well, they already hold, in the last two seasons, uh, 19 of the 20 top games <laughs> in the history of the Cactus League. So from it's Sloan Park, perspective. I'm not sure they can drive the numbers much more there, but I think on the road when they're visiting the other ballparks, we'll probably see some uh, rise in attendance for sure. Is that entire complex, I haven't been out there in a bit, has that entire complex been built out or is there more coming for the Sloan Park? There's there's more uh, in the master plan. There's some more thing, you know, associated with some, some other amenities around the stadium, not necessarily the park itself. Okay, so like retail. Okay, so b business concerns and these sorts of things. Correct. Um, with that in mind, how do you keep, again, I've been here long enough to remember when I could go to a spring training game and have the section pretty much to myself. You walk in in the fifth inning, they don't charge you, if parking's a breeze, all that. But that's a long time ago. How do you keep, though, that casual nature of spring training when the Cubs are big? The whole operate, this is big business. This is serious stuff now. Can you keep it casual? Can you keep it carefree? 
Well, ticket prices have definitely gone up, and a lot of times that's control of, of the teams themselves that are, that are driving that. But for the most part, we're trying to make it that, that setting where you can, on a Sunday afternoon, take your family out to the ballpark, play catch in the outfield, and, you know, take, have a hot dog and Coke. So... Yeah, and you, it, that's interesting though. How, people don't. All teams don't. All teams control their spring training activities, or, or do, do municipalities control any of that? You know, every contract set up a little bit differently from that perspective. Uh, some some of the uh, municipalities are involved in some of the ticketing as well, but for the most part, the teams. Okay, give us a schedule now. When, when do games start? When do games end? Well, we've got. Uh, first of all, we have our Cactus League luncheon this Wednesday uh, that we still have some tables to sell. So we'd love uh, opportunity for more people to attend that. If, uh, check out our website at www.cactusleague.com. And uh, starting on Friday, the first game is in Scottsdale with the uh, Giants hosting the Reds. And a full schedule starts on Saturday and runs through April 1st. Runs through April 1st. So, and, and occasionally some of these teams will be here just about the day after uh, the season starts. I mean, you, you get that sometimes, don't you? Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, you stand, are you excited? I am. I'm excited to. Uh, Hit the diamond for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it's good to have you here. Thanks Thank for joining you. us, and uh, best of luck this season. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. The Western Spirit Museum in Scottsdale opened two years ago and has since picked up national recognition, even becoming a Smithsonian affiliate. Producer Maria Portillo and photographer Rob McJanet give us a closer look at the museum. In the heart of Scottsdale's art district beats the spirit of the Old West. You can see it in the eyes of Native American children, the grizzled wrinkles of old cowboys, and the proud faces of Western women. It's only been open for two years, but director Mike Fox explains that this museum has been a vision for much longer. It's been a dream of this community of Scottsdale for a number of decades, back actually a good 30 years ago. Those 30 years were spent raising funds and curating the collection, finding those symbols that tell the story of the West. This is a, a very unique museum uh, that has objects that are three-dimensional, working cowboy, saddles, spurs, boots. And then you can walk into the room right next to you and see in the gallery um, those same things, you know, the saddles painted on, the, on horses and fine art. So we have quite a diversity of art of the American West. That art attracts out-of-town visitors and also young Arizona families. This museum was really established with one goal in mind, and that was to help young boys and girls whom live here, maybe were born here, and possibly will live the rest of their lives in this region, to have themselves a better understanding and appreciation of place, a place of birth, place of education, place of future work. Its location is a huge part of this community. Arizona artist John Coleman says it's been a long time coming. Scottsdale has always been sort of a hub uh, of Western art. But when this museum came, it, it was like the third leg on a table. It finally pulled everything together. Thanks to collections from artists like Coleman, the museum has gained national recognition. In fact, it's one of the youngest institutions to ever become a Smithsonian affiliate, a title museum director Mike Fox does not take lightly. Because of this affiliation, we do have always the responsibility to see that this institution is um, professionally presenting itself to a public in the manner that the Smithsonian would expect of any affiliate. As an affiliate, the Western Art Museum can rotate art with 19 other Smithsonian institutions and present art collections like the Taos exhibition yeah, the Taos is, is uh, I, I like to think of it as ground zero for Western art. They put together a group that started to, to create a style and a look, um, which has influenced artists like crazy. I mean, uh, in recent history especially. The exhibition tells the story of 19 European artists who travel to the West and by accident land in the community of Taos, New Mexico, eventually settling there. Curator Trisha Losher says the artists were inspired by what they saw. 
the, the people, the Hispanic people, the American Indian people, um, they were quite taken by a very distinct kind of, of quality, both in terms of culture and landscape and the environment, uh, in order to create what they saw as really a unique American art. The Taos exhibition is filled with letters, journals, and photographs of the artists who lived in Taos. The vibrant colors and generous paint strokes tell more than what fits the frame. So we really have an exhibition that's not only great art and masterpieces, but it speaks to relationships and communities and really just being who you want to be and finding yourself in the West. And ultimately, the goal of a visit here is not just to look at what the West was, but what it still is and what is left to preserve. The Taos exhibit at the Western Spirit Museum runs until April 30th. Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, State Education Superintendent Diane Douglas talks about a lack of IT funding for her department. And we'll look closer at plans to expand the state's school voucher program. That's at 530 and 10 right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.